You are live. Hello, beloved audience. It is my own pleasure to be again here to, with your favorite pod, podcast about physical education and sports science. And we are talking directly from our hub of scientific and applied content, Podiums Podcast. And yes, we are in the turf season. More precisely, precisely, we are in our, at our bonus episode. But first of all, I want to thank you all for all your support in Spotify, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. However, we consider that the only way we can continue produ producing uh, relevant content in this, I would say, kind of huge wave of fake news and influencers that share and spread a lot of um, knowledge not based on science is if you help us to be more relevant in this digital world. Therefore, I want to ask you to use your beautiful finger and press the button and say, yeah, I support this and help us to be bigger as we should be. Thanks a lot and many thanks in advance. In our turf season, we have um, one main question, how to be the best sport teacher in the world? And to help us to understand and to give the answer, of this question, we have the pleasure to interview Svenja Wolf. Liebe Svenja, dear Svenja, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. This is exciting. <laughs> it's my own pleasure to, to be here. Yeah, dear Svenja, can you tell us a little bit more about your, um, let's gonna say, your story in, in sports science, sports psychology, where you started, where you have this moment, well, I want to be a scientist, and where are you right now? Yeah. If you have, I know it's that long, but yeah. Just... I'll give you the abbreviated version, yeah. And yeah, yeah. it's funny that you talk about the sport teacher because I think that's probably where it all started. My mom used to be a PE teacher. My family is just very athletic and I'm definitely one of those people who had very positive early childhood experience and developed that sense of like, I am an athletic person. And I, for the longest time, didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And that was the one thing to fall back on, be like, all right, I'll... I'll go to school for sport. I like sports without like any game plan in mind. And then mm -hmm. I really like the the sport uh, science degree, just bumming around, taking all a bunch of courses. And then at some point you kind of need to figure out where you want to go after. And um, I used to run track competitively and probably in hindsight suffered from competitive anxiety. So there was like a very personal interest that drew me towards sports psychology and then I did an internship and kind of like thinking along the lines of like applied sports psychology and ended up specializing in kind of the like training and science bit of sports science mm -hmm. and then wrote my thesis in sports psych and I really enjoyed that so I really liked the science part behind it the literature search the really the opportunity to dig down in one topic um, I like the stats I like just all of it I thought maybe this is something I should, um, maybe this is something I should um, pursue a little bit more in depth. And then I had the opportunity to do my PhD and I did, and I continued liking it. And I went abroad, had a really good time and kind of forged that. You, you did it in, in, in Holland, right? In Amsterdam. So no, I, so yeah, institution wise, I did my whole like university schooling PhD at the German sport university, the sport. Ah, yeah. Wow. I, did. I didn't know that. Yeah, PhDs. So that yeah. was my um, kind of, and then I went abroad to Canada for a little while and came back and then did a post. And then but I don't know exactly when I decided this is going to be my career. It's almost like a slow thing where the applied thing just became less and less and the research thing became more and more. And then by the time I got my PhD, I was ready and set on. I wanted to do postdocs and I did one postdoc at UBC uh, Vancouver and then I did my other postdoc in Amsterdam indeed with the ah, social technology yeah. people and then also had a first professorship like assistant professor position there and then from there kind of during the pandemic I virtually moved to um, Florida State University and then a couple mm -hmm. years ago actually physically moved to Tallahassee and that is where I'm based now. Great story. Yeah, I think I love to ask this question because it's the moment where you realize, what the fuck? So I, I, I remember I was playing and then I got more interested about the guy who was teaching me and then the story behind this guy. And then, 
well, I want to study. And then when you were in university, yeah, I, I love to do this question. Yeah, quite interesting. Uh, and uh, if you can consider a some, let's gonna say some um, research fields that you are more interested interested. Can you tell our, our audience which topics do you like the most in, in sport science or sport technology? Yeah, oh, 100%. So um, I, two topics I love, group dynamics and emotions. And then I focus particularly on kind of like integrating the two. But those are my two, two areas. Nice. Yes. And as she has said, we today we will talk about one publication, which it's I was reading and I said, whoa, I never thought about this. And I said, well, I want to read again. And I was like going deep. And I said, well, it was October 2022 and no one has published something that's that relevant in this topic. So the, the paper uh, which uh, I'm talking right now is called A Review of the Interpersonal Experience Expression in the Regulation of Emotions in Sports. Dear Svenja, can you tell us a little bit of a little bit more about the story behind this paper. What was the motivation and what was the main thoughts that draw, drove you to, to make this review? Yeah, no, 100%. And so this is a review paper and I kind of like selected it because I think it provides a good summary of some of the work that we've been doing. Um, so it doesn't provide like one study, one piece of data, but I think it's a good summary of kind of the importance of the area in general. And the, mm -hmm. the main question or what I'm interested in is sport is such an emotional domain. Like we, it doesn't matter what level you play, you get, like you care so much about things, about winning and losing. And I mean, in school, it's the same thing. There's so, it's such, it's so emotional. Like you can be so embarrassed or even ashamed, or you can be very proud of something you achieve. And we kind of started looking into that, definitely not enough. And at the same time, we'll keep ignoring that sport is also a very social domain. So we are, a lot of our emotions are, we don't experience them in a vacuum. We don't feel them in a vacuum. A lot of it has to do with communicating information to others. A lot of our experiences are stimulated by others or by thoughts of others. And that's kind of what we wanted to just draw attention to with our review that basically, I mean, you know, like this is kind of like a community around the globe where we just think like, all of this is social. It can be in groups. It can be in classes. It can be in what like fan gatherings. But it's really that thing where emotions inherently emotions have such important consequences for performance, for adherence, enjoyment, all this stuff. And then the emotions in turn are so socially mediated. So that's kind of what we like really broadly what we wanted to call attention to and like provide an overview of the research that is there and hopefully you know like stimulate more research in this topic. Yeah, I, I do think that this this uh, paper, this review, in especially especially, is um, it's, it gives a good a good overview about this topic. But one one point for me was not clear when I just read the title. You know, sometimes we just get the title as the first um, a trigger point. Um, this word expression, because um, I was wondering, well, expression in this context means how do I read the expression from others, or how do I express myself? Well. Now you are here, so could you answer me? Because I, I think maybe someone also had this question. Oh, that's, no, and it's such a good point. And I think one of the things that I find like crazy fascinating about emotions is always that idea that they've developed with a purpose in mind. So they're kind of like, we as humans have emotions because they're super adaptive. So think of disgust, great example. We're kind of like, we are, ex like we have a facial expression for disgust that kind of is like, like I'm going to do it now, but let's get that this like, <laughs> <laughs> we close your nostrils, you like narrow your mouth. So you just kind of like you're squinching your eyes because you want to avoid any poisonous substance getting into your organism. So that's mm -hmm. like the, my personal expression. But then over time, these kind of like adaptations have become socialized. And now we have these social mm -hmm. signals where if I stare at you really angrily or I look at you disgusting, like with a disgust face, that also communicates something to you. We're like, okay, she'll, so maybe she does not like this piece of cheesecake, or I misbehaved and now that person is angry at me. Or I smile at you and you're like, oh, well, that's like positive feedback for something you did. So that's where initially this is a very personal thing where like these expressions just come with the emotion and they're helpful. But then over time, they've developed into means of communicative signals. And I find that super fascinating. And then you're absolutely right that 
I might be expressing something which I think is very clearly a certain emotion, like embarrassment, for example, but then you might be perceiving that as me being defiant or something. And there's some research that shows exactly that. There, there's misperceptions, for example, between people from different cultural groups. Well, which we are living funnily right now. <laughs> Hopefully not, uh, because we know each other. But yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I think this is quite interesting because uh, as a sport teacher, there is a, a point where you are teaching. I mean, let's gonna say we have a phrase or a sentence that you have to tell the students or the scholars, and at the same time you have to read the expression of 30 people in movement, yeah. and Svenja. It is hard. It is so hard. <laughs> no doubt. Um, especially when you challenge them, in your opinion, it's just a step forward of, I don't know, one movement. But they say, I can't, but they didn't say. They, they behave and they express. Um, do you think that, uh, uh, let's call it a regular sport teacher should be able to um, read expressions, uh, but also to express her or his, uh, himself in a different way that everyone can get the message at the end? Or is it typical human development, yeah, typical human social skills that we could consider that every sport teacher should have? Or also, yeah. have? and we can drop the sport teacher. I think we seem like every person. Yeah. I feel like generally we're not super great at emotional literacy in terms of like what are we feeling and can we feel more than two emotions, happy, sad, and angry. Um, in this particular case, there is it's called emotional aperture that idea of like looking at a group and getting a sense of how everybody's feeling. And I agree. I do think that's hard to kind of pinpoint specifically like that person back in the left, like second row is feeling this. I, but I don't think that's necessary. It's more kind of like reading the room. And I think mm -hmm. that's one of the things teachers just innately or anybody like a university teacher, or I think like a performer too, where you have this interaction with a larger group, you innately have a sense mm -hmm. of what's going on. More structurally, I could imagine that, you know, as a teacher, you're like, you kind of know your students and you might know like, well, this is the most whatever timid person in the room. So focus on that person. If they're happy, then you have a good sense because I don't know, they tend to be like the most afraid. So you kind of might have these like signal of people you could focus on, but I do think you have a pretty good sense of um, reading the room. For a teacher, the number one thing, or for a coach too, or really anybody who's in a leadership position, other people literally look at, I think the biggest thing is to be aware that, you know, like we are communicating something whether we want it or not. So be aware of what we're communicating and ideally communicate the thing you want to communicate. We can say something verbally, but if our nonverbal doesn't match that and students especially pick up on that, right? Tone of voice, body language, they pick up on that too. So I think that's the important part, being aware of what we're sending. This is quite funny because I was teaching some uh, hours ago and, you know, in Germany, you, can, you cannot teach only one topic. You have to teach two topics. And I was teaching some mix of history, geography and social sociology. Well, it's mm -hmm. a girl, also Gesellschaftslehrer. And I was learning. And there are some moments that I know I'm in the front of 27 students. I don't have to say nothing. I just have to behave with my upper body and head my as a, um, head my head in the way of saying, "You want to really keep doing that," and it works. Therefore, I, your uh, example fits a lot with uh, what I was just living some hours ago. Great, um, Svenja. We also have some interest in about regulation um, of emotion in sports. Uh, I remember, and he was actually, as we were talking in the backstage, um, Sylvain also had done some research about this. And I will never forget his um, science slam where he brought this um, episode where Zinedine Zidane lost, in his opinion, uh, his mind. And he was heading the, uh, I don't know the name of the um, Italian uh, soccer player with the head. And then he was using this as a background story for uh, regulation of emotion in sports. But I, yeah, there are many theories behind this. So could you tell us about more about regulation of emotion in sports? Yes. There's so much I can talk about right now. Um, so I'll focus a little bit on the basics and then the stuff like we're particularly interested in, which is the social regulation part. Okay. So generally, there's a variety of like things that 
people can do to regulate their emotions. And James Gross has developed like this really neat little model where there's a few things we can do before the emotion even occurs. And then when, okay. when it occurs, we can kind of do these response focused um, regulatory things. Like for example, you can suppress your emotion expression. You can try deep breathing um, to relax yourself. You can try, um, this, like you can try, I don't know, like going for a run, being really active to maybe increase your levels of activation and your, your affect. So that's kind of like once you already experience the emotion, okay. probably most effective is anything that's kind of an antecedent focus strategy where you prevent any undesired emotion from occurring in the first place. So, so, so somehow, somehow you are already prepared if it comes. You, okay. Mm -hmm. So, and that's kind of the idea of like prevention is better than cure. And there's a variety of things. So if you know you always get anxious in the situation, you might avoid the situation. Or if you know that like being with these people makes you happy, go be with these people. So it's like situation selection. And then if you're stuck in a particular situation, well, maybe there's something you can do to make the situation more accommodating. Mm -hmm. um, let's say, you know, like you have to go, I don't know, I have like these random examples. So let's say you have, for some reason have to go winter camping and you really don't enjoy being cold. So bring warm clothing or like snuggle up tightly or bring like whatever hot water bottle that then is going to make you less anxious about this. So that's a situation modification. And then there are some stuff where, you know, as competitive athletes, for example, we're in situations where we can't change the situation. Like it is an important competition mm -hmm. and we can't just like go to another meet. So that's kind of where you have the more, it's called attentional deployment and cognitive modification. So you can focus on certain things. You can focus on whatever the scout in the stands. And if you don't perform well, you're not going to be selected for whatever team. Or you can focus on your friends in the stands who are like giving you emotional support. So it's literally like focus. Mm -hmm. And then the final thing, the cognitive modification is like a reappraisal. So cognitively focusing on instead of like the the negatives on the positives um mm -hmm. or giving yourself a, an internal pep talk or anything like that so that's just a very brief overview of these different approaches we have to emotion regulation as a person within us in general mm -hmm. and then what we're really interesting in interested in is that idea of like maybe we don't have to do all of this labor by ourselves maybe other people can help Right, like in so that's the interpersonal emotion regulation where somebody uh, else is you like a trainer or the co-players uh, who 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 is the person especially who which could play uh, is this whole who who is the person who could help you in this moment you mean so for example a coach like I've definitely when I was running track like I would my coach was like knew I was getting anxious prior to. Uh, my races and he would come up to me and just give me a pep talk and I don't think he did that because I needed I was running whatever the 800 you do not need strategic information you just need to get up and run as fast as you can so I think that you know that's he did that for emotional purposes to just like calm me down or mm -hmm. teammates in the team sport if you are I don't know you in handball if you missed a shot and then you're coming back for defense and somebody just gives you a pat on the back and that doesn't have to be um, verbal either so that's like I feel like People close to you can comfort you. It could be positive reinforcement. It could also be, I mean, it can also go to the extent where you are heckling your opponent. So that's also, you want to make them angry. You want to distract them. So this is this can also go, and even, even um, in, let's say, interpersonal relationships where you want to make people, let's say, guilty, feel guilty for not having done something. So does that not have to be like making people feel better? You can also try to make people worse. And I think yeah. that's interesting. It does have a little bit of a manipulative note to it. Um, but that's something we're, we're really interested in. We're researching in my lab, but also in like our little corner of the community. Quite um, I, I like, I... I never yeah, got... well, teacher, right? And the teacher, same thing. Like that's, if you see your students are anxious about doing a high jump exercise or something, well, you can do something to calm them down. You don't have, like, they don't have to do this job for themselves or classmates to each other. Or if somebody like, did not get a good grade on an exam or whatever it is, like building them up after that's all interpersonal emotion regulation. And um, yeah, so that's really interesting. And again, there's, the body of research is growing and I could keep talking for another hour, but that's just an option also to just throw out there. 
No, I, I think this is quite a good overview that you brought to us, especially talking about, um, as I just have said, in the physical education environment, we face this in a daily basis, in a minute basis, I would say. And this is so important. And I don't think that this such great science and theoretical background um, lands at the ears of many sport teachers. Therefore, I, I like the idea. Um, but going one step further, um, in, there is some situations that are not related to the environment, but is more related to yourself. Let's gonna say I shame myself to, I, well, teenagers are teenagers. We were, you know. Um, let's gonna say I don't want to get, yeah, sport clothes because they shows the shapes of my body. I don't want to uh, make a lot of sport because then I will be, um, yeah, wet uh, anyway. Um, do you think that a sport teacher can also create a strategy to help the, in these special situations where there is a kind of shame behind or shame and want to like be obscure? Yeah, and it's probably in terms of like there is a good body of research on kind of like body related shame, body related envy, kind of that in an exercise domain, not school sport related. We all know there are people hardly do PE research in sports psychology, but at least from that exercise domain, there is actually a good like body of research coming out of kind of Toronto and uh, University of Western Ontario. Um, what I think is interesting because again, shame is such a social emotion. You are like ashamed somebody else is going to like, you're afraid somebody else is going to judge you. You're ashamed that your body doesn't live up to certain standards that society prescribes. And I think that the idea is as soon as it's social, we as other social agents have a chance to do something about it. This is not a personality thing that's just innate in one person, but this is coming from us. So, and that's probably too much to put on one single physical education teacher to change our society. But like, if you can, in your classroom or in your school, foster an environment where it's, yeah, it doesn't matter to look sporty or it doesn't, you know, it it's not something where people there's like a good body type or a bad mm. body type, like being really thin and athletic is not better than being chubby and never having done sport before. And I think that's, that's hugely important because then people have no, there's no norm they're failing at. So they have no reason to be ashamed. Mm. And one thing I think that might also be like almost accidentally mm. where we reinforce people for fitting a stereotype where we're like, Oh, you're so athletic or, um, just kind of like fostering this ideal and of course like social media and other media are contributing to that but at the same time they also give us the opportunity to see all these diverse body types and shapes so that's probably something um and there's very little research on how this could be done but i'm thinking along the lines of you know just like not addressing physical makeup in a sense of like somebody being more athletic than the other person really focusing on individual effort and just kind of things that are under somebody's control mm. that's what i'm thinking but again this is very very non-research based no, I, I, well but it gives us also again a nice perspective because i now i'm teaching um uh, self-defense so self yeah. yeah the first uh complaint that Dr. Walter, der ist stärker als ich, er ist stronger than me, I can't. And I said, mm -hmm. this is, so mm -hmm. before starting saying, as a, in, we, as a, um, a fight for, we say hello, so we, we, we greet, the, I say hello to the other and so on. They don't start, the, they don't do this first step because they, before the fight, well, it's not a fight, before the fight starts, they say, no, I, I already lost. And I, say, I say, what, this is, uh, how, tell me. Yeah. Try to explain. Yeah. Yeah, 100 percent And I'm like, I would say this is self-handicapping because they're afraid that they're gonna look bad, right? And I think like in that situation, if you are able to emphasize that it's not about the outcome of the interaction, you don't care who's like the whatever who who yeah. wins in this instance. It's about like, you know, I think it's very about like that kind of idea of task-oriented um versus ego-oriented climate i think that would be really helpful like focus on yourself here are your goals this is what you want to achieve don't focus on like outperforming somebody else and mm. 
if that's something you can do in instructions, if that just like where it doesn't become a thing, like it's just not rewarded if you're the winner. It's rewarded if you implemented a good technique or if you did better than last time. If you just tried. Um, yeah. I have better uh, results, uh, outcomes with the girls than with the boys uh, in this topic, uh, uh, self-defense. Yeah, that, that makes so much sense. I'm thinking... Because I would argue that maybe, especially like adolescent boys have that idea of they should be this, they should be muscular, they should be strong, they should be good at this. Whereas yeah. like adolescent females just come in and be like, well, I'm not supposed to be good at this either. And if you did something more aesthetic, probably be the other way around where boys yeah. come in and was like, I'm not supposed to be good at this. So if I fail, it's not a problem. But if I'm a female and I'm like, um, I don't look graceful, I might have more problem with that because that's kind of the societal yes norms that are or prototypes that are ascribed well, yeah this this fits a lot um in what i like the most is the the outcome well when we go out of the gym and then i feel the guys getting tired because they were fighting and you just trying to show it and yeah. the girls are like always have their head up and say wow that's, i made it so kind of the experience was better than uh, was the, the the most important outcome than the trial if I won or lost. So the, the positive experience. Uh, this is quite interesting because I do think there is a relationship in regulations of emotion and also a development in teenagers. And this is so important nowadays. Um, but going a little bit further in the topic of physical education, once we have a pool of questions in our um, Instagram account, Podium.us podcast, and we ask the teachers to highlight the three main problems in sport uh, and physical education. And I will tell you the, the three main problems that they have highlighted. And I want to know your opinion about this. So they said the, the major problems of physical education teachers are, first of all, high cost of founding, continuing education during and after graduation. The second point was Difficulty, or well, it was hard to find and to get access to updated scientific information as opposed to the high degree of exposure of digital influences without the scientific, any scientific background. And the third point was low salaries. I know it's so complex because, well, in US, Brazil, Germany is totally different, but could you give us a, a little bit more about your perspective about these three points? High cost of continuing education, uh, difficulty, well, it's hard to find updated scientific information in comparison to influencers and low salary. So I don't know if I can say much about the low salary. No, well, um, you can just talk about what you want. Yeah, and then the, the only thing I would say with low salary is that it is absolutely important that people feel they're rewarded adequately for their work. And if, and salary just like, you know, that's kind of the, um, the proxy for value we have in the work domain. However, if you just don't have the financial means to pay somebody more, maybe that you can give them a reward in any other way. So that's, I feel like that's something if I'm a principal or if I'm an organization or whatever, or like a school faculty, whatever it is, but showing that appreciation of somebody else's work mm -hmm. is already going to make them at least feel a little bit more valued. Because I think a lot of it, yes, you need money to survive and there's like, you know, cost of living, all these like hard expenses. But I think part of it is also just wanting to be seen and wanting to be valued for the hard work you're doing. So, and that does not have to be financial. We like, yes. as a principal, I'm not going to be able to pay them more, but maybe there's another way I can make them seen and I can make them feel appreciated and like, rewarded for all the stuff they're doing. That could be verbal, that could be little recognition gifts, but that's so that's the only it thing. Can I time. It can be time. Now in Germany, we are talking about time. Many times better to give more time or quality time is better than to give money to many people. Yeah. And again, like even like being able to like change work hours is not something I will do at my school independently. Like this is such a systemic thing yeah. where I feel like it's hard. Psychology is yeah. not going to change that. Like that's just that needs to go from a higher level. So but, you know, that's what I was thinking, like even at a very small level that is in somebody's control would be a show, a demonstration of appreciation with regard to that. Um, with regard to the first. So 
not sure if I under, understand. A, a high cost of uh, founding continuing education. So they say that when they are doing the graduation and also after, it's too expensive to learn more. So okay. They, and they say, well, therefore, at least in the Germany environment, I can say, and also a little bit about Brazil, you want you you learn three years for third years. So and this is and in these three years, what you are learning now is from uh, let's gonna say old research, and then there is a, a huge um, delay of time about knowledge that you are learning. So and you learn three years for the next thirty years. So um, yeah. In your opinion, how is the U.S.? Can you have, how is that? I, my exposure to school over here, like to high school, is very limited. No, I, I mean, so, to get more, but more I education. know, yeah. So, but I know some of uh, my friends have physical education degrees, and I know the pay is horrible over here. So that's what I know. I don't know what the like further education and training is. To be fair, but I do know obviously a lot about Germany, mm -hmm. and. Okay, that makes sense because I feel that ties into the second point a lot. Like I would say two things, like it's all, I, I'm like, yeah, it's all the research background, but I think Go it's ahead. all expectancy value. It is, you need to see the value of engaging in this further education, of looking up new research, and you need to feel competent and have the means of doing that, which I feel is the second comment people had. Um, so with the second comment, I think, to be honest, this is on us as researchers. And I'm not saying like every researcher needs to do this personally, but let's, of course, teachers are not gonna be able to, first of all, access all these art scientific articles that are behind a paywall. And even if they do, they're not, and it's not because they're stupid, but like they're like written in a weird academic language nobody understands. Mm -hmm. They're not written in any applied format. And when are they supposed to read this? When do they have the free time? So I think there's all these, and there's, quite a body of research looking into this and we've written our own little paper on like research practice application it's really the same barriers for teachers for anybody in applied practice coaches teachers mm -hmm. it's just that it's not like we are producing this knowledge and we're not we're putting it out there but we're not getting it across this gap so it kind of stays in the research realm 100 percent yeah yeah and then um, and I'm not like, and for researchers is not incentivized either. My university doesn't care that I'm doing this podcast right now. They want me to pump out more scientific papers and get more grants. So I think that's also, there's the work to be done on the research side to incentivize that or people who can bridge the gap like you who are hosting a podcast. And one thing we're trying right now. So I did, when I was in the Netherlands, we did run interviews with coaches and mm -hmm. kind of assuming that they like sports psychology why aren't they using it? How would they like to get that information presented? And kind of like it became their wish list turned out to be a little bit of like a website. And mm -hmm. then now here in Florida, my students and I were starting to build up this website where the idea is that, yes, it's all. We can, we can put this uh, website in the description of the episode. Yeah, we can do that once it's like right now it's just a shell. We're building the oh. content, but it's going to be like a legit thing. No, and that's but that's really the idea. And it's obviously taken much longer. It's much more complicated than we'd anticipated to this be a challenge. But the idea is that um, we who know the research are able to filter out the bad from the good. Yeah. And then we are trying to process all that information into little digestible pieces and then put that on there and if people want to know more here's all the references here's the long version but if you really only want to know like the highlights we're giving you the highlights so you get like a fact one page fact sheet you get a regulation exercise you can download and run with it but if you want to on the website there's all the references there's all the stuff so just so you know and i loved what you said earlier so you know like you know this is legit compared to all the random stuff that's out there. And I think that's absolutely true. I've seen so much where people just talk and I'm like, that is based on nothing. And I think there is a big added value for the research component because it means that whatever you're doing is more likely to be successful if it's based on research. For sure. Um, and in, in science, it also gives you this validation, that uh, peer validation or and also method validation and also and all many other stuff that... Well, when an influencer talks about the push-up that should be done in this way, you you can say, well, it's what he's saying. I I, I just want to give you an example. I at school, 
sometimes I'm faced with this behavior, like a student or a scholar come, hey, Dr. Walter, we should do push-ups in this way. So I, as a, me as a teacher, I have to kind of prove that this kind of push-ups doesn't work out for this 12, 13 years old, just based on the high level of, well, I, will, I, will, I would read this as a high level of uh, in, in injury rate that he can get if she does or uh, he or he does in this way. So I, it, we are facing now a kind of is a conflict. The influencers say it's almost true. And we as a sport scientist, and in my case, also a sport teacher, I have to prove back, no, it's wrong. Yeah. Uh, and I understand this, this uh, when, when the sport teacher said, well, it's quite hard to find updated scientific information in comparison to influencers. And that was one of the things we also like the updated bit, because I could publish a book that's already outdated by the time it gets to print. Right. And that's why we want to do the, the website. Like, that's why it's so important, because it is that dynamic thing. We can update and we can integrate. And what we're envisioning with that is exactly it's a it's a it's a resource. If you have a question like whatever. Oh, shame whatever is about shame, you go in, you can, t you just know it's there. You can access it. You can type it in and then you'll get the information. And then if you have two minutes to look up what is shame, you have the two minute, like tiny summary. But if you have a little bit more time, maybe because like, you know, that's something that just keeps coming up, you'll have all this information you can look at, but you, we're trying to like, because time is of the essence. So just like summarize the most important thing, mm -hmm. like really quickly and in an understandable fashion. And I think that's, that's really important. So my lab group, like it's called the laboratory for emotions in groups and organizations, the Lego. Lego and, yeah. and then we're calling this the Lego coach because it's for coaches, but it's for performance leaders, but we're also trying to coach people in these kind of topics. I, I love the idea. I love the idea. Yeah. Well, and I love the, every, like a lot of people are doing this, but I do think that's the important thing where we are presenting something that's accessible, like internet based, um, something that is short and something that's in an understandable language, and at the same time, um, that is built on credible information. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think because I think that would go into both the kind of like the the priciness and the availability things. Yeah, well, price is not the value, but yeah, I got um, what you mean. Yeah, um, actually, we um, as a sport, I would say as a platform for a sport. Uh, um, sport science, but also under the umbrella of sport science, we have physical education, sports psychology, and so on. We support this kind of, of ideas because I, I feel, because I was in the, my, my story was, as I told you before, sport teacher, science, now sport teacher again. And they don't, don't talk to each other. And this is not, they don't talk, they don't understand. It's not that I am speaking yeah. Portuguese and you are in German. It's yeah. that they don't understand the body language, which is the most biological grounded way of understanding people that the primates does. They don't. And then I was like, how? So we want to create a bridge and also many tunnels, as you have said, and I do support and I like the idea. Great. Great, great. Well, if you are finished, when you are finished with that, we can also make an episode about this. It would be great. I'd be totally into that. And that's really one of my passions too, that integration between research and practice. And you're like, you're preaching to the choir here. And it's, I keep hearing the same thing. Like we're, we're very aware of the problems and the barriers, but then how do we, how do we fix it? And yeah, like there's a lot of people doing some stuff out there, um, but we definitely need, need some more. Yeah. yeah. And we need some more. And also, I think the point at the end is also, as you have said, you, you have used the word uh, access, accessibility and I like it. It should be for everyone in their hand reachable. So, and this is an, a nice idea. Great. Um, thank you for your perspective. I, I sincerely appreciate. And I have maybe a funny question, but well, we have some background in your family, and you can say, well, you have to be as my father and my mom. Uh, I heard this once, but the question is following What kind of skills or, yeah, soft and hard skills do you think a sport teacher should have? And so, well, it should be as my father. Cool. Nice answer. <laughs> well, that's an interesting question. Um, because I, I just want to give you the background. Um, especially in Germany, uh, it's not only about teaching sports. I, I feel that in Brazil, you, if you are, were a good athlete, you can be a good sport teacher. But I think in Germany, you have another component. And that's why I'm asking this question. 
No, and that's interesting. I know a little bit kind of like, so first thought was having a level of self-reflection, which probably goes for anybody who's in any, like anybody in the world, but also for, especially for people who are in any sort of leadership capacity. Mm -hmm. Because as I said initially, right, if you're not aware of what you're communicating non-verbally, what emotions you're communicating, how you're feeling in the first place, you, you're still communicating, but it's just not under your control and you're yeah. not in control of the effect. So I think that's important. And I, like, I teach at university and there's days where I feel horrible and my students don't know that my whatever closed off body language has nothing to do with them. So mm -hmm. I can tell them if I'm aware of it, but if I'm not aware of it, they just like, they're probably going to be super confused or think like if I'm a little bit more like standoffish, it has anything to do with them. So, but just level of self-awareness, I think is super important. Nice. Um, and then the second thing I, I was thinking that's very, as I said earlier in the uh, backstage, my mom used to be a physical education oh, teacher yeah. and um I know a lot about, especially I feel in Germany, schools are such closed off systems where yeah. the only other people you interact with are other teachers. So it becomes like this very, it can, I think it can be a lot of social support. I think it can be a great environment, but it's also something where you can develop like certain perspectives on the world and on your job and how things should be and how horrible students are and how bad the principal is, whatever you have kind of like, so I think like that, the social norms aspect is really important Got it. Yeah. and I don't know what the specific skill is there but that idea of like just like evaluating these types of things so for example if the norm is that we all go out there and we are looking for the cutting edge research and we continue to educate ourselves and become better that's a great norm that's something we would want right and this is something that could be fostered in a school or only within the sports faculty but if the norm is that we know everything already and the students are being such a pain and we're being underpaid and that's fostering a completely different sense so that's and again i'm not i'm not sure what the skill is we could be teaching teachers here but i think that's another um another really important component being aware of like that closed off system Fully, i i fully agree i i think uh, the self-reflection point is so essential. Also, before, while, and also after teaching sports, um, uh, physical education. And I think this is also, uh, it reflects uh, a kind of willing of having self-development. Mm -hmm. uh, I met a guy and he's in this school where I'm teaching now, 34 years long. So he, and I am 35 years so he's longer there at school I than I am kind of almost like. Why? I, yeah. And then I was like, Kara, man, I have to learn a lot from this guy. Um, but this is my way of dealing with the different people and when I get in a new environment. But I do think that self-reflection is a, it's one of the most important points because then you can improve on a daily basis. You can improve and get even better for your teacher, for, well, as a teacher for your students and so on. Great, great. Um, dear Svenja, would you like to share your any final thoughts to our audience where maybe you could give us a little bit more, yeah, your own perspective about um, physical education, but also about your research? Oh, yeah. Thanks for the stage. I'll be <laughs> happy to do that. No, for sure. Um, so one of the things I do research on, and I think that's interesting, and I think like especially in a phys physical education or any any group setting really that's something that could be developed a little bit more so one work like one my line of work one aspect i focus on is the idea of collective emotions yeah mm -hmm. so that idea that a group of individuals feels similarly and that's maybe not a good thing if you want to if your entire soccer team is like super anxious and shaking prior to a match but this could be a great thing if your entire physical education class is super excited about doing the Cooper test and running for 12 minutes, which I'm like, odds are this is not happening naturally. Um, so, and, <laughs> and that's just something I'm interested in because we're seeing this as a phenomenon that happens. Mm -hmm. And it seems as if this is related to good outcomes. So it seems kind of on a competitive level that people, if they're emotionally more aligned, they're also coordinated better. And, you know, like, again, soccer, like if you kind of like coordinate it better with your teammates and know where they're running, that's good for your game. 
Um, and it translates depending on what the emotion is. So if people are, if the team feels happy versus angry, they're also performing better. So kind of in that area, we see the task related outcomes, but, and I think that's where, especially for schools, this can be, or exercise in another non-competitive environment, um, the collective emotions also have, seem to have these integrative properties. So if we're feeling the same, we're feeling more cohesive, we're feeling more of a unity, we feel closer to these other people. And I think that's something, you know, like that, that kind of cohesion that's what mm -hmm. we're striving for in school so much because that again is related to all these other downstream benefits and we can go on a we can go on a class hike we can go on a tour yes there's all these formal things we could do but if we can just enable kind of like a shared collective emotional experience and that's something we can do in any classroom really that might have similar properties and it's yeah it's very similar because you feel like we're all feeling the same about this. Just that fact that we have this in common already brings us closer to each other. And I think that's really interesting. What we're finding, which I think is super cool, is that mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be a pleasant emotional experience. So even if like, we're looking at this in sport, but even if we lose and we all feel bad about the loss together, that's a good thing. So I think that's, uh -huh. yeah, so, I think that's maybe th something to keep in mind that if as leaders, teachers, we can foster these shared emotional experiences, that is something that can bring our class together. And, um, and this is something like, for example, if you have them working together to solve a problem and then they do it successfully, or if they're doing something like something really challenging where they're all pushing themselves and they, what you were describing earlier with the self-defense and they all do it and they make it. And like, so generating these kind of emotional experiences. And then the other thing is ensuring that people have a chance to like share their emotions and talk about emotions. And um, so if they're excited, they can communicate their excitement. If they're proud of themselves for having done something or if they're afraid of something. So creating emotional experiences and then creating the opportunity to share your emotions verbally, non-verbally with each other. I think that's something, again, based on my particular line of research around these collective emotions that can really be a powerful thing. And it's so easy to do, right? You don't need to do, bring anything in particular. You don't need to do anything else. You can just do this in passing. And I think that that's something um, I like about it so much. I am so impressed because many things you have said fits a lot with normal reality as a sport teacher in Germany. <laughs> yeah, and that brings me back to just kind of that, like being intentional and self-reflected about this because there is going to be an emotional tone of your class anyway. You are going to be sending emotions anyway. This is happening, but just being aware of like, you want this to go on like the anxious direction where some people are like super hubristically proud and other people are super ashamed. Or do you want to go this and like have this go in a productive direction where people together feel some sort of accomplishment? Just great. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Yeah, that's the stuff like we're really working on. This is pretty novel, and um, but that's probably the one thing I would want to get across. Like this is. Something. And I do think those guys who have experience positive experience, but also as I have said, negative experience, but this togetherness, we they may have faced this at sport uh, and physical education during the teenager. They potentially they are more sensitive to be in the work as an employee or um, in the adult life more social as well in the in the positive way i think this this positive form or experience may shape positively and i am not that expert in the real life well life outside of school and this is and such I mean, a great also thing. if you yeah. had a good time in physical education not because you were like super successful and could do all the things, but you just like have a positive memory or this was a good time where we work together, where I get a sense of belonging, you're probably more likely to be active in your future life, right? Just sure. like health wise, you don't have this like, I'm just not an athletic person. I'm never going to do sport again. So that yeah. is also something I think we can take away from this. Nice. <sighs> what a nice <laughs> opportunity to learn. The Spania, well, from my side, I'm so happy to get in touch with you again and to get in touch with this review. I, I think this is, it's so important to do what we are doing right now, but in a special 
case, uh, this collective emotion fits a lot with uh, school environment. So thanks a lot for sharing your thoughts and your expertise. And I'm most, more than happy to check out your, uh, your final version of your Lego coach uh, website. Yeah. Uh, so now I have more pressure because now it's uh, worldwide will be uh, famous now. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, thanks a lot. I sincerely appreciate that. I think it's uh, the most important information you have said. And well, thanks again. It was uh, quite funny to see you again and to talk about what your uh, research, one of your topics. And I know you have done a lot, but yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for having me. As I said, I'm super passionate about like starting to bridge this gap and I so appreciate you doing this. No, oh, my pleasure. If you have any students uh, in the future with new papers uh, and also some new yeah, research questions that were maybe answered or uh, have a new perspective, please let me know. We are more than happy to interview those. Good. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay, dear audience, it's my pleasure to say goodbye for now. Tomorrow we have the final, final, the second bonus episode. It's actually um, a funny episode uh, with a, um, a PhD student from Daniel Memart. Do you know? Uh, yeah, of yeah. course. Uh, and it was one of his indications for Podium's podcast. And I'm so happy to have this guy here. I finally, this is so funny, and then I can say this now because tomorrow we will laugh. I interviewed his girlfriend also in this episode, but I didn't know that she was his girlfriend. Now, love and science is always together, emotions, uh, uh, so it fits a lot. And yeah, it's my pleasure to see you all again. And yeah, Svenja, it's my pleasure to see you. Have a wonderful day in Calif uh, in Florida. Oops. Yeah, we're in California. Yeah, <laughs> we all wish I were in California right now. Thank you. It was amazing seeing you. Um, yeah, have a good day as well. It was my pleasure. Now, put the final, uh, I want to say, a vignette. Wait. <laughs>